Hi, this is Hank. Using the new data tracker layout. Does this work? Hello, Hank. Ah, wonderful. I'm copying the um, agenda into the uh, uh, interim notes, the core of the agenda, so we can uh, start from there. At least I'm trying to do that. Obviously, <laughs> I had to log into something beforehand, so that didn't work, and try one, I'm trying it again. Yeah, this looks good. Is there a link to the, oh, there's no ticket tool, got it. Exactly, it's one of the buttons in the meeting schedule, but I can also uh, paste it here into the chat. He says optimistically, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many clipboards. So, <laughs> good. Go, return, send. No, I don't know how to how to do this. Dang it. Um. Ah, here is this. Okay, if I put this here. This should work. Okay, wonderful. So this is the notes, and I will be have to talk to my son real quick. Seeing if Monty is available for the verified relying party conversation. I don't see the note uh, in the note taking tool. Is there supposed to be a new agenda or? I see the one from December 11th. Yeah, no, the agenda, um, the agenda is always just in the meeting thing. I, I always copy it into the top of the notes, but there's nothing automatic that does oh, that. Oh, I, I see it in the, okay. I see it in the. Yeah. yeah, I just like to have a fighting chance at staying on topic. So I always stick the agenda in as the sort of framework for the notes, but because we haven't, haven't done that yet today. We are four minutes past Steve. do you think you can um uh, execute an ordering of the uh, of the prs and 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 things that will give monty a chance to show up later sure um so over the last uh, couple of weeks and happy new year to everyone uh we've been working to just close down uh, on the architecture kind of doing a triage of it uh ori and i talked about getting a uh, dependency kind of diagram. So he put together the number 148 for us to track uh, what we need to get some of the specs complete. Um, and as you'll see, there was a couple of things. So in, uh, if you look at 148, uh, we've got a nice diagram that shows uh, kind of a dependency ordering. So we've got uh, the architecture kind of in the middle there. And if you notice, Scrappy is dependent on the architecture. Uh, originally, it was the opposite because the architecture referenced Scrappy. And so now with uh, PR149, um, we basically reverse that order. So we still get the benefits of tracking Scrappy. It's just the Scrappy is an implementation of the architecture. So it just cleans up uh, our ability to do that dependencies. Um, and then uh, the architecture is still dependent on the Merkle tree proofs and the cozy hash envelope. Um, so those are things we want to discuss and get more complete. Um, that was some of the dependency tracking stuff. And then we did, uh, I think this was Hank, did some header reshuffling. And then there was some just draft cleanup, just cleaning up some loose ends such as TBDs and some of the dangling uh, refs to RFCs and so forth that were no longer as relevant. So that kind of brings us up to where we are today. And if you, you know, use the nice little link that we've got uh, in 
the architecture branch for the editor's copy, you can see the delta as it's evolving. So we're in pretty good shape there. Let me just get that link. I'll paste that in the notes just for, we're not notes, but here. Whoops, not search for users. All right, who moved the cheese? There's the chat session. So that link shows you the latest uh, comparison to where we are uh, from the last draft. Questions, thoughts? No. So um, I think this is um, essentially necessary to have a first hit at the working group last call for architecture. So with um, the diff you're highlighting here. Also, I think it's easier to follow something when you screen share the diff, not only post the link, but that's fine. Oh, yeah. In general, so because I was like clicking frantically, where would I, where should I look? And so, um, so I think uh, one of the items, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go off agenda here, but but one of the items, let me look at the agenda quick. Um, I think one of the items is uh, this, this what you highlighted implicitly, the blocking architecture diagram that already maintained in an issue or maintains an issue. And, uh, and I added some opinions there. I'm not entirely sure if I did the right thing, but I think people are asking for what's uh, blocking next to reference dependencies here. And this is my my uh, issue 148 now resides my point of view to that um but it probably is not complete but it's at least a starting point so that's that's my um comment on this so i think the diff is only the very first step we need to do a few other things first i think issue 148 is tracking some of it I don't really see if I'm still. Oh, the, the the speak indicator is now the image. Okay, then probably I, you can. You all heard me. <laughs> yeah, I'm tracking you in the notes. Thank, thank you. Are we using the queue? We are. Recognize AJ. <laughs> okay. What what is the dependency? in the skit architecture about the hash envelope. I thought that was not a dependency, or did I misunderstand? Um, so effectively, it might become a dependency to the Scrappy, other this uh, supply chain reference API and um, the, the skit API reference. And that is basically because uh, uh, Cozy is, is almost providing all the uh, necessary building blocks for a uh, detached payload that you can um, make transparent and and register the transparency service and also validate without requiring the actual content um, so uh, um, it's it, i think already highlighted that's basically a, uh, a a a new signed statement type or an, an, an enhancement of signed statements to, to allow for that and of course when you have a remote signing service uh, like uh, an API that uh, uh, Scrappy is providing, um, you want to also uh, have these uh, hash envelope features probably in there. So the uh, implementation here uh, will require it probably that is doing API proof of concept, but uh, I assume it's it's less um, the architecture. So we, I think there's no dependency here that says we are defining any kind of uh, sign statement uh, um, enhancements here in the architecture and so that's why it's uh, free floating and, and it's not a blocker on the architecture okay i, I only ask because it's still listed in the um my, my favorite uh, form of of blocker explanation is this mermaid diagram so does that mean that someone would need to take the small work to push it out of the architecture and into scrappy so that it's no longer a dependency or am I just misunderstanding things? This seems to be, you're basically saying the current state is that it is somewhere a dependency. It should be moved to Scrappy where it will be less of a dependency. 
I, I think it's even Ori's commendation. Uh, so I think Ori is also in the queue. Maybe he uh, can elaborate on that. But yeah, that's my understanding. Oh. Okay, I'm done. So yeah, Ori. Yeah, so it's um basically if cozy sign ones are the only uh, sort of cozy object type that Skit architecture supports, then you need a way to do cozy sign ones by reference or by value for content of arbitrary type. And the by reference with hash is is this thing that the cozy hash envelope is supposed to solve. So if you find a way to fit that constraint into cozy sign one, then you don't have a blocking dependency on the architecture for uh, for it because you just it's just another type of cozy sign one. However, um, there is some discussion on that uh, pre zero zero draft uh, suggesting maybe use the cozy uh, hash value structure, which is not a cozy sign one. You know, if we were to do that, then we would have to kind of rethink all of the architecture for that particular object type. So uh, I guess the that's my the main way to think about it is the, the hash envelope stuff blocks the architecture if you need a different set of CDDL to describe a, a signed statement that is a signature over a hash. And I don't think you do, and I don't think we should do that, to be clear. I think how we go about doing it can be solved in a separate document that shouldn't block the architecture. And that's why I say that code, the hash envelope document is uh, detached from the architecture as a dependency and potentially even detached from Scrappy as a dependency. It could just be a thing that we do at some point in the future, and then everyone who wants to use that kind of uh, signed statement will just be able to do it. That's it. Okay, good. So that, that sounds like a more of a question mark than a, a straight up thing. So let's get the um, yeah, AJ looks happy. So let's get the uh, the scrappy split and adoption finalized, and we'll be looks like we'll have clarity there. Um, good. So what's the next thing, Steve? Then. Sorry, my mic got muted there. Uh... All right, so the next one we wanted to, uh, there was a conversation on verifier and relying party that AJ and Monty were working on. So I wanted to give them a chance to talk about their updates to that. Okay, should I, he's not here, right? I, I wasn't able to find him this That's morning. So let's... I've sent some emails to him asking if he liked my impressions or not. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I have more questions than answers to crib on a way that John uh, just summarized the previous comments. Um, I'm relatively new to this and um, I'll post, I'll post a link to a specific thing in GitHub, which is not a PR. Now, the reason I didn't do that is because the way we write, our diagrams is fine. It's just that it will require a lot of work. So um, I prefer that I am aligned or understand the intent of people in the group before going through significant changes. I see there was some feedback from Ori yesterday. Thank you to him. Um, you can listen to me talk while I stall and try to get the specific comment. Here we go. Um, if people want, I can attempt to figure out how to share a screen. But um, I tried to take the current state of the diagram in a different technology in this mermaid thing so that I could quickly edit it. Um, there, I have some open questions about what some of the different roles really mean, only in so much that the idea of consumers and auditors as opposed to verifiers and the lack of relying party does put us out of alignment with, it seems, not just rats, but other ITF and non-ITF specifications where there's a lot of interweaving and alignment on terminology. So the current state I can see, I moving forward, it would seem that we would want to use the term relying party for a variety, maybe for a variety of roles. And that we also do want to use the term um, 
or we want to we want to use the term verifier and relying party, and maybe we should have the notion of who owns the verifier, the relying party, because one of them is not necessarily an organization or a group of people. Um, that might sound like a uh, a hand waving gesture, but other specifications to which we are interconnected do make use of these terms more precisely or in a way slightly different from us. And I'm not sure if there's a reason for that historically. Moving forward, I would be fine um, not explicitly using the term auditor and maybe adding owner as a concept of the people that operate a verifier and a relying party. I'll pause for questions or comments. I'm not really sure if that was coherent or people need more clarification from me. So to move away for uh, the term auditor, for instance, is is the idea to use terminology closer to rats and some of the other specs? That was the intent. So I, I picked up this issue because I assumed that might be the intent. Um, I didn't originally post it, but it seems that that would be wise moving forward. Um, or it makes some good points about the directions of arrows and whatnot. I, I, I agree with those, but... Um, I understand that we had a notion, there are several, auditor being one of them, or several notions that I think for um, for outsiders coming in makes sense, but that doesn't align with any of the terminology that ITF or other adjacent attestation or transparency specifications use. So it would make sense to get rid of auditor and then actually use verifier and relying party where it's applicable. I just wanted to make sure I understood the data flows and other things as it would require the changes to make sure I actually understood the intent. Cool. So Ori's, Ori's in the queue. Um, so let's let Ori in. Um, and if you'd like me to scroll to a particular part of the page with a screen share, let me know. Now oh, this this diagram, this rat, infamous rats diagram is great. Let's just <laughs> leave this up for a second. Um, I. I think the word auditor is is confusing to to folks. Um, I think it means something in the business setting and in a sort of legal in a governance setting. It means many things, but I think it, it gets a bit confusing in sort of defining a role for security processing. So I tend to think of relying party as the party that really needs to make sure that the data isn't tampered with. And there's sort of two classes of relying party. There's relying parties that don't trust anyone and that have to do all the verification themselves. And they're kind of like a relying party that's also a verifier. And then there's, uh, you know, sorry to use crude language here, but there's sort of incompetent relying parties that rely on a trusted verifier to do the cryptographic bits. So I, I think of that being, if you introduce relying party, it's because you're trying to create clarity that there is an entity that requires cryptographic assurance, but that may be incapable of in doing that work themselves. And so by adding a relying party to this diagram, you sort of say, you know, verifiers are guys that check cryptography, but they may not have a stake in the game in terms of the specifics for a given message. Whereas a relying party is a guy who needs the cryptography to be checked first, but then has a stake in the game with respect to the interpretation of the message. To me, an auditor is always a relying party, not a verifier. They're, they're, they're a part of a role that is trying to fulfill some business function. They're, they're interested in the content of the messages, not just whether or not they put signatures check. That's it. Yeah, makes sense, Roy. Um... Uh, this the problem I have with this whole discussion is is if you start coming from the bottom up and say hey, we're going to define terminology and not think from the top down, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble here. The auditor role, specifically for software and and governments and so forth, is a negotiated role between companies and so forth. China and the U.S. don't necessarily get 100% free access to all the information and data that gets at the next layer. You're as soon as you start putting verifier here and it starts getting into confusing conversation of the individual customers are doing their own verification. And that is when we start going to the next level, runs into this buzzsaw of privacy of data 
and protection, giving everybody access to to all the, the information that SSDF asks for is not a wise move, which is why we we terminate term, use the term auditor here because it fits into the role the governments are asking us to fit through. So if you're trying to drive this from the bottom up and assume that everybody's going to continue to use your terminology, it's not going to work past this layer. So that's why I truly believe auditor makes perfect sense here. It's a distinguished role. They get access to potentially other data and they make a specific set of claims or, or, or additional statements when it gets into role-based uh, flow for software supply chain. If you'd make this verifier, you're just going to make it really confusing. Okay, I'm stepping up from the floor. This is Hank. <clears throat> okay, Ari, I, 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 I disagreed with what you said, but I had a hard time remembering all of that because to me it sounds sounded overlapping and very uh, um, conflicting. But you posted something in chat. Can keep auditor but then is an auditor a relying party or a verifier that is an excellent question are we talking rats or skit that is my counter question because you can't just make a rats verifier some skit verifier that makes no sense to me at all unfortunately and and i'm happy to have some dialogue about that quick here right now uh, because uh, ultimately i assume that uh, all no, of course they don't because they don't need it. Um, um, there is no responsible human interest in. Um, uh, Oscar was, Ari was asking in the chat, does rats have auditor role? And of course they do not have an auditor role um, because um, the auditor is basically the consumer of the attestation result in the end, and maybe a verifier owner and therefore a provider of um, uh, appraisal policies for evidence, maybe, depending how deep the auditor looks into things. Um, but um, but again, uh, talking auditor role in REDS does not make a ton of sense, uh, because my assumption is that a, a trusted attestation result from a trusted verifier is audited by auditors and they just consume items here and not involved in this at all. And that is why I'm a little bit uh, confused by uh, using these terms from RETS natively in SCIT, because I can't make sense of it. Is a SCIT auditor a RETS verifier, uh, Ari asked, and I would say no. I would assume it is a RETS relying party. That is also because that is consuming attestation results about the systems in question to some extent, if you're talking software or runtime authenticity of platforms or something. Um, so I assume it's uh, uh, the role REDS uh, relying party uh, could be co-located with, and that's what you said, okay, could be co-located with um, a, a auditor role for example, but these are very different duties that you would combine. So the, the auditor role makes would make use of attestation results to, to bolster their um, confidence in the authenticity of uh, supply chain assertions. Because when you uh, basically just say, my apple was green on a supply chain transparency uh, append only log, um, of course, that's just an endorsement. That's no evidence at all in red terms. But from, I don't know, some other supply chain uh, point of view, saying that your uh, Apple was green, signing it in your good name, so to speak, putting it on the uh, iPad only log in the transparency service is very, very called evidence. So even the meaning of evidence is very different here, like build evidence. To Reds, it's just build assertions. You have no idea if the system tells you the truth or not. You just go by face value and maybe the ownership of possession of some uh, key material here. So again, um, the strength of the assertion in Reds is very, very harder than we would uh, assume it, I think, in, in the first steps of uh, software supply chain use cases, which are basically I told you so, trust me, and then you can find out later if that was a lie or not. In REDS, lying is per, per design prohibited due to the implementation of rule of trust and entrusting those via endorsement. Very good, Hank. Thanks. I've got to follow up to that, but I'll, I'll take my place in the queue. Um, yeah, very clear. Uh, Ray? Yeah, hi, I really liked how Ori explained it, except um, it seems, and I put this in the chat, that that there is 
the, the notary is something we talked about before as a name of a uh, role. And <clears throat> that seems to be similar to what the verifier is doing. Um, it seems to me that there is a, a an action that's needed by uh, by a machine or you know an entity that uh, in the system that would confirm the uh, you know proof of possession of the pri the you know the private key of whatever the party is in an interaction um, that then would be documented by that <clears throat> that entity which you know you could call a notary if you want because it it basically checks the identity or the ownership of that that private key and then later <clears throat> the relying party could just rely upon that little proof that's provided saying look i i you know i checked with this pr that the private key is is there and here's my my the documentation of that and my little um emblem so instead of so so it you know moving toward uh it, feedback interaction versus uh, a authority documentation which is like x509 and authority says here we've documented this and i'm the authority um and instead it's based on a uh, feedback which is more like you know what they're doing with um uh the uh think of it now but you know when you're when you're when you're checking for um secure uh, browser and um certificates um, anyway, that's that's my input. Thank you. Grand, yeah, that's clear in the, the chat as well. Thank you. So, uh, AJ? So, I understand the desire for having specifications or documentation that face end users, like people who are auditors, to use those terms. Um, like Ori pointed out, uh, for specifications on, on software implementation or these protocols, if we can be so bold as to call them that. Um, the reason I thought we should be removing moving to relying party and verifier is not just because in adjacent but not necessarily mandatory, read what Hank and other people said, um, relationships to rats and other attestation or other things that are related and similar but not exactly the same. We do have OAuth and other things where relying party signifies the people that are basically consuming uh, certain information cryptographically or not through protocols. Whereas auditor is a very vague term that, again, we're all individuals. I abhor using in government space because it requires it basically is a superset over a whole bunch of people and technologies that do things that are often not very related, but we pretend they are. Um, in the government space, by the way. There is a nuanced difference, at least in the NIST world, between auditing and assessing. And I don't even want to get into that here, but that's where I'm saying that rabbit hole is almost endless. It doesn't really speak to the people that are trying to build software or protocols and interact between software. Um, and the terminology here is different, which is why I was okay with moving away from it. That being said, it seems that there's some ambiguity here, and I'm trying to make sure that I actually align with what's intended. Um, John, if you scroll, oh, I don't even know what direction because I have it on my screen. Um, I'm having trouble understanding if we go to a little farther down, um, if we should not be splitting out the relying party and the verifier um, uh, further up. It, it's like underneath the dot. I had a, there's a number two, and then so would that mean? Yeah. Um, it, it, in any event, there is a, like, I, as we're trying to find, if you look, it's, um, slightly far, there it is. So like that was where I tried to land, but I get the impression that maybe further discussion is needed, although we have another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, I assume there are other things on the agenda, but I was going to attempt to make an A, A, S, V, G version of this. So it could be merged into the spec and then try to handle the arrows. but. An auditor is like the kind of person, if I understand correctly, that would be a relying party owner. It's usually associated with 
a person or a group of people and not just um, auditors or people that will be consuming things from a verifier through a transparency service. So to basically just say auditor is kind of front loading a subjective term that's used by many people in the industry that might not, that might like both try to be specific, but also be incredibly vague. And I'm still okay moving away from it, but it sounds like that might not be the consensus of the people here. Um, I'm not sure how to move forward, I guess is the end of my long winded comment. And then I will remove myself from the queue and stop talking and we can discuss next steps. Cool, thanks. I think the queue is uh, exhausted. Um, in fact, I don't know how to clear it, but I guess, oh, there we go, do that. Um, yeah, so it seems to me just in, in terms of making official progress, um, there's a question to be asked. And I think th this feels like the sort of thing that, that we should at least briefly put on the mailing list rather than deciding here. But it seems to me that we might like to make an explicit decision to sidestep any language that's already in near specs if they're not the same. Um, I think that's the thing we should we should make explicit. And and I think it's it's worth doing on the mailing list because um, I suggest that in the spirit of being more collaborative and compatible with those specs. So this isn't to sort of move away from CT or RATS or anything else. But just to avoid confusion if we're using the same word to mean different things when we expect them to be used side by side um so i think that that's a, a real consideration just on its own face um uh, and then the other the other thing to to consider is i wonder if this is a layering violation a little bit um that the very specific yeah ray uh, roy's point is extremely important that in the context of our primary use case there are existing rules and roles and people who who do jobs um but what we're designing here are building blocks that execute in all kinds of bits at all kinds of steps along the way and a verifier might be an auditor or they might be a tool or they might be somebody who's doing a bit of the job and then they pass it on and the thing gets bigger and then they do another bit of the job somewhere else so um i think it might be easier or better to use the very generic terms and then say ha have examples of how it could be built so here is an example of an auditor who uses these building blocks as opposed to calling it that in the in the architecture it feels like a bit of a layering violation um so that's it but with my you know, my main input is i think we should have a uh, uh, an explicit conversation about not using words that other people use unless they mean exactly the same thing Yeah, go ahead, Ray, and then hopefully we can yeah. um, we can move on. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I didn't mention it, but I, I do think that using the word auditor is a, is a mistake. Um, auditing, because we do it all the time, tends to be a pretty wide ranging activity that encompasses pretty much everything you can you can find. And at, at having a small little role in a machine that's called an auditor is, is just uh, there's going to there there's some better term we can find than that. That's just uh, uh, I think we should avoid that. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, okay, so we got Hank in the queue now. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to one of the uh, excerpts here from Ray. Uh, Ray uh, wrote in the chat, uh, but Hank, I think uh, um, the verifiers and Reds and Skit, I think, are expanding this are quite similar. The Reds checking of evidence is like checking for biometrics. So I was explicitly highlighting signature checking. So if evidence is signed, typically all evidence is signed, it means something else than in Skit. In Skit, it means that a, the key material holder uh, said something. Uh, so to speak, in his good name, right? So is making an assertion, putting it transparent on on the scope uh, for every, for the audience to 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 know. Of course, this can be small, just one entity or whatever. So um, in rats, it means and something totally different. It, in rats, it identifies uh, to some extent the uh, attesting environment, which has been uh, um, and uh, which basically has has gone through a, a layered attestation, probably, and is, is basically 
are um, saying what you what believable is, is committing believable edits into to being uh, the first claim being um, signed by a root of trust and that root of trust is endorsed so the endorsement basically is say trust this unit that you can cryptographically identify okay i did that and now the thing is layered into some evidence uh to multiple layers most likely and that means basically um that you uh, that the, the the statement is trustworthy and and that is a very different assertion or the, the confidence level of, of the signature that allows you to to, to actually do believ believability checks here and and that is absolutely not the case with signed statements or the receipts that's just uh, it has been said and i'm trusting the uh for example the the skits transparency service to do exactly what it did and therefore uh, the receipt is based on good faith that the trust uh, sorry that the, the transparency service is implemented correctly if you want also believe that the uh, transparency service is exactly doing it what, what it want to do and nothing else you also need a uh, reds evidence to be created by the skits uh, service that's also in a tester right so um there are two two layers here of the, the believability layer and and the exposition of the of the assigned statement content and i think that's very very different meanings and that's why i'm saying that the verifiers in both words do different things although both of course check signatures with the same structure which is cozy yeah i i i agree with you and that's why i didn't like using the term to begin with but um the uh in other words, in rats, they, they're doing a whole lot more than just this one step. However, if you were <clears throat> looking at uh, the the act of verifying the, you know, the, the private key, which is a, a step in the process of verifying. Now, if you person, ha if entity happens to have a private key that they can expose and not expose, but, but you know, provide a proof that they have it, then that's one very very good way to, to say okay well at least we know that's that's the private key that you have or the public key is linked to it um the if you're talking to a device across you know internet of things device uh, you may want to use those values that you get to to verify that the environment looks looks appropriate and, and it's kind of like the and, and maybe there's some secrets you can look at to verify that yeah other people wouldn't know about this and we can we can find out this is actually the device etc uh, along the lines of what you might do to a human if you said well are you the person you think you are and are we think you are and now let's look at your id let's look at your um you know the barcode on the back of the id let's look at your i don't know thumbprint etc and so you you know uh, you try to document who it is it's an it's issue that is uh, widespread trying to get that identity figured out and so talking about devices versus people is very very similar and then that that role of being the verifier you know in one case you're going to the machine and asking it these things but in the case of like a human being you're asking for IDs and stuff so it's a kind of a same kind of a role even though very very different in actual implementation so from that standpoint I'm starting to think that yeah so verifier might be a, an okay term to use there, and even though you're right, they're doing very different things. Uh, okay. Okay, great. So that sounded like a, a bunch of agreement, if not a conclusion. So um, hopefully we can make progress on that. Uh, um, yeah, on the list and, and in between. Um, so, Steve, I remember there's at least one big PR that, that definitely needs coverage um, today. So, uh, next one, please, if you can. Yeah, that would be the configure, uh, complete configuration, registration, and policy receipt inclusion. Um, so, that's the one where, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, we have some open discussions on uh, how the identity is being tracked. And unfortunately, I'm looking, I've been trying to ping Cedric or Yugesh or Antoine. Um, and they're not here to represent that one. If we look at the doc, and I'll paste the link to it here. You want me to share the screen again? Um, sure, sure. That's where I can try to take notes. Um, 
So basically, the and Ori, you were asking about this as well. The the most recent draft has references Steve. to configuration. Steve, let me see if I get Cedric to, Cedric to join here. Okay, I'll give a quick recap while you're doing that. Um, we've been discussing that we want the uh, registration policy that's in effect and the configuration to be captured in a receipt. And the premise there is that if you're evaluating a receipt uh, for a signed statement, that you know what the state of the transparency service was at the time the receipt was issued. Because you might determine that on Monday, you know, everything you know is valid uh, and the receipt was issued on Monday. And then you learn new information and the transparency service needs to be updated with the new registration policy or configuration, which an auditor or some other role uh, might determine that that receipt is no longer as accurate uh, as you would like it to be. So knowing the registration policy and configuration for a particular receipt, a particular transparent statement tracked by a receipt is very interesting. Uh, the challenge is how do we reference uh, those transparent statements that are on the append only log? Is there an identifier? Is the identifier for the transparent statement? Is it for the signed statement? If you have multiple signed statements um, that you register over time, are those the same one or they become different because they become registered? We got far enough at the last IETF to realize that the registration policy language and even the configuration language uh, is not currently going to be specified in the draft and it would be implementation specific. That kind of questions whether this whole thing should be implementation specific, uh, meaning the configuration and registration policy inclusion. So that's the conundrum that we're in. We have part of the discussion completed in the draft uh, where we talk about configuration and registration policy being the receipt, but the details are not complete. I'll pause there. I'm just reading the, the comments from Roy and Ori. Cedric shows online, but he's not responding, Steve, so. Okay. So, uh, Roy, you're saying, uh, oh, you're talking to Ray. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what part of this is architecture? Yeah. So, Ori's question is exactly what we've been evaluating. Uh, the concept sounds perfect. Uh, the question is, do we have enough details that we could capture to uh, require all implementations to follow? this guidance, not guidance, but follow uh, it in the, in the spec when we don't have certain things in the spec, such as what uh, format the configuration or registration policy should be in. So I think we're leading, leaning towards moving that out um, so that implementations can specify that with high value uh, and until we get more clarity and agreement on what those details are, uh, it would not be required across all transparency services. That's my summary. Ori has Ori his hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I would start with the sort of the harsh view that none of this belongs in the architecture. Um, so we're not gonna describe uh, content type specific to registration. We're not going to talk about non-opaque payloads regarding policy configuration. Um, and we're not going to talk about there being one mandatory to support identifier type for signed statements or receipts. And then if you, if you accept that, then you also accept that there won't be any basis for interoperability regarding references. And if, if that's a problem, the only thing you really need to address is the identifier part. You don't need to get into the content types part. You just need a way to be able to say, 
Every transparency su service supports this identifier scheme for signed statements and receipts. And so I can use this single mandatory to support identifier scheme to establish interoperability regarding references. And what that means is implementation specific on those services, but when you refer to something that's on another service, you're implicitly accepting what that other service is and what they're doing and all of the content types that are specific to sort of ensuring that. So I, for me, the configuration stuff is sh should totally not be in the architecture, but the identifier piece potentially can go in the architecture. But you know, just cutting to the chase, like the thing that's going to cause is the one true identifier scheme debate for what is a signed statement and what is a receipt. If we can't get through that debate, then I think even that piece should be left off, and we'll just accept that different clusters of this implementation will create different identifier schemes and maybe refer to each other using those schemes, but that there won't be uh, anything in the architecture that ensures interoperability around references. That's it. Cool, thanks, Ari. That's a good representation of where we got to at 118 as well. Um, so Since good I gave Ori this headache to begin with, <laughs> uh, continue to do so. Um, but the original intent of my ask was some indication to know when something in this space changed on on the skit ledger. I didn't, you know, the, we explored various things. My simplest thought was a monotonically increasing number so that when I receive receipts, I know whether I've vetted or reviewed that policy and when that could have been done with a specific you know, implementation detail requirement. But the hint of that as I'm flowing through all these receipts and signed statements, to know at volume that something has changed and I have to potentially go off and do an, a different operation is what was missing. And if, and I, I see Ori's points perfectly fine. If we just wanted to use some indicator of here's our state, that would satisfy my need and i regret some of the you know the conversations and defeat and so forth but the problem still exists is that we're not going to go off and re look at registration policy on every receipt that we process so we need something to hint and that's the problem that or was trying to help me with and we went down a number of rad, rabbit holes if we want to simplify it or throw it out that's still going to be the problem on a federated set of skip servers. Great. Thanks, Roy. Um, yeah, you, Ray, you have the floor. Roy, I think I'm faithfully representing what you said, but definitely check my notes on this one because I'm not completely sure it's very subtle. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say I agree that that's, that's a tricky problem. Um, and without having something watch the thing and see if some changes were made by someone else, um, you know, it's kind of hard to know if the changes were made unless you actually review the whole damn thing. And it's a, a similar problem that we have when we're working with cloud resources if we want to know did somebody change something in the cloud? Um, is there a file changed? Uh, like right now, there isn't really any good way to do it except for just looking to see. Uh, and that means looking at a lot of things, which is a waste of time. So it, it would be good if we had, this is, a, this is probably a really good um, optimization. Um, I don't think it's essential, but it, it would be an optimization that, that would be helpful if we did have some way to know exactly what what Roy was just trying to present thanks yeah I think we're in this spot where we recognize the value can we get it to a point of clarity that we can include in the architecture or maybe even in scrappy uh, but do we until we get that clarity do we include a, a basically a partial definition um, I, I kind of that, resist against. Yeah. I kind of resist against Scrappy because it, this has to be 
you know, if we have a storage subsystem of of signed statements or or transparent statements, the ledger isn't going to be part. Of, Scrappy is not going to be part of that, right? If it's done off the side, but that's why I'm I'm struggling here with how Scrappy would solve that problem, Steve. Well, Scrappy is just it's the set of APIs that give you these cap these enhanced capabilities. So oh, I agree. I agree. If I wanted to go back to the ledger and say, "Give me your state," that would be a Scrappy discussion. But the 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 fundamental problem that I'm trying to reduce this to is given transparent statements, how do I know under what audit policy they were done under? And that's the guts of the problem, right? It has to be something that stays with the, the receipt through all storage subsystems. And Scrappy is, is potentially how you come back to the well and say, hey, Kate, tell me what your registration policy is, and I want to vet that. And that's where Ori is going, well, that's potentially specific to each implementation. And that's why I don't think Scrappy is is valid here. If we want to reduce it just down to some indicator in the receipt, then Scrappy is is not the right place. Uh, I think the what I'm the, where Scrappy becomes interesting to me is Scrappy has additional details on top of what's in the architecture, and I think being able to specify whether it be content types or other details in Scrappy allows us to add that capability. Um, it also just gives us a chance to kind of buy more time to think this more through. Again, I, I agree. I think we, we generally agree that it's good to have this information. The question is, can we require it when we don't have it fully defined? So it's more of a, a layering or maybe even a timing and a version question. Yeah, it feels like a suck it and see case to me. Um, the, the reason- um, Suck it and see, what did I hear? <laughs> Uh, the, the reason we're leaning on Scrappy, I think, is is going right back to Ori's point. The architecture only needs to specify that the signed statement possibly refers to, and the receipt definitely refers to an indicator of the state. And that's all it needs to say, and that would work, and that would that would uh, account for this thing. If we're going to put it into Scrappy, then we do need to decide very positively or negatively what the format and data type and location of that thing is. <laughs> um, and so it kind of forces us to be more detailed and and and, and thorough. I think that's 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 where I think the, the difference in terms of closing off the work and how. Right. How yeah. I think that's why the proposal was: if we just restrict this to just some indicator in the receipt, the rest of it can be open as a V two or whatever longer term, and cut it off the discussion because it rat holes too quickly. All right. in need yeah. is some indicator perfect good that's it that's a great statement thank you <coughs> okay cool thanks so good good timing got five minutes left um so steve one there's one thing left right the um uh the rather large intro changes yeah so um I want to make sure I pronounce his name right so I won't butcher it. Uh, so we've got some new uh, content from TH Govel, um, who's been really helpful in uh, trying to strip down and reduce down the architecture document. Uh, there was a discussion over the weekend. Well, so it was a pretty pretty good uh, PR, but it was also fairly meaty in, in how uh, dull or sharp the knife as you would have it uh, in cutting up some of the content. Um, there's been some questions on it uh, that were, there was some suggestions to maybe reduce it down to smaller PRs that we can uh, incrementally add. Uh, there was some activity on Friday. Ori, I don't know if it looked like you had some input in it if you wanted to speak to some of the updates or we can just take it to the issues PRs and possibly the mailing list to further refine it. Um, but I was just appreciative of the additional contributions. Um, 
looking for additional clarity from others. Corey. So, yeah, I mean, on the, I think you're referring to the open poll request with, I think, two change suggestions on it still. Uh, number 143, improve introduction. Right. So, um, I, if we're looking at it, it would be easier to remember. I guess my general sort of feeling was there was good suggestions coming in regarding explain, explaining the connection to CT that I think are important for us to comment on. And then there was other pull requests that, uh, so I'm mostly sort of like looking at the objections on the, on the review and wondering, is there any part of the objection that's worth commenting on this call regarding? Like that, that's what I was trying to say. Like if you have change requests on this, do you want to speak to them on the call or not? That's it. Yeah, I guess my, uh, my point is just to highlight for others to take a look. Um, there's some really good content in there. There's really good exclusion, you know, pulling stuff out. Uh, and if anybody's passionate around some of the content that's being proposed being removed or clarified, that would be good to capture before we merge. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I have change requests on, on this one, which were just to put a couple of sentences back uh, that were taken out. Um, I, I wanted to raise it particularly. I think you're, you're, you're dead right, Ori. The, the, the question is, does anyone have any objections? And if not, we should obviously merge it. Um, I wanted to get it raised here only because it's a big change. And I was kind of surprised when I saw it. But then reading through it in detail, actually, it's removing a ton of stuff that's duplicated in more detail in the sections lower down. Um, so it actually looks like a good way to progress the document, make it a simpler thing to adopt and a simpler thing for other groups and other stakeholders to review. So I actually think it's a really good change. It's just very large. And, and so I thought highlighting it and making sure people saw it um, was, was a good idea. <clears throat> So I'll just, from a process perspective, I'm gonna to like to try to get that one called down to uh, an agreed or non-objected set of uh, changes that I'd like to merge. Uh, it might be aggressive to try to get it done this week, but that would be my goal. So if folks have opinions, please take a look and weigh in your thoughts. With one minute to go. Great, yeah, and good, good input from another another new participant as well. It's a good, uh, good health indicator. Um, yeah, so one minute to go. Any more for any more? Anything, um, anything we need to address? Anything that needs to be taken to the mailing list? Hearing none. Uh, let's call it a day. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks, folks. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye.